20 years ago. Can you remember 20 years ago? 2004. It's hard to believe that was 20 years ago. We're getting old. Some of y'all are getting really old. We love you. 20 years ago in 2004, my dad accepted a job offer to become the manager of the Scott Trade in Birmingham, Alabama. So our family packed up and moved from central Texas, where we had lived for seven years previous to that. We packed up and moved from central Texas to central Alabama. And when we arrived in Birmingham, so did Hurricane Ivan. Do you all remember Hurricane Ivan? Okay. Uh, it, 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 literally, it happened as soon as we got into Birmingham, Hurricane Ivan came through Birmingham. Of course, it had been destroying the coast for, uh, for a while, uh, but it came through Birmingham. And uh, I remember we decided, I went to three different high schools in a month in Birmingham because my dad had zero plan for how we were going to, what we were going to do. He hadn't looked for a house. We didn't have a house. We stayed in an extended stay hotel for a month. And uh, I went to three different high schools. The first high school I went to, uh, or the second high school I went to actually, the second high school I went to, uh, the students talked about their power being out for an entire week because of Hurricane Ivan. And it actually is the origin story for why I hate spam. So these, these kids were at school. I was a, a freshman in high school. These kids, they're telling us about how the power went out, and they were talking about how they were really, really hungry, and so they opened a can of Spam and ate it with their fingers. And I just got that image in my head of little feral zombie children eating Spam out of a can, and I, I, ever since then, I, I just can't. I can't, I can't eat it. Um, and... Uh, I don't have an origin story for green bean casserole. It's just gross. But um, the, the spam, I do have an origin story for. But I remember that being a very, very difficult month. Even as a, even as a resilient teenager. I mean, I, you know, like as a, a 15-year-old, 14-year-old, like nothing bothered me. Nothing bothered me. I, I was a resilient teenager uh, but I remember it being very, very difficult because we lived in an extended stay hotel for an entire month. We lived out of suitcases for a whole month. And I remember the feeling of refreshment and joy when we finally found a house to move into. I remember the feeling of refreshment and joy when we finally found a house to move into. When I think about the New Testament word abide, it's not a word that we use much today. We don't, we don't really use it outside of church context, I don't think. Uh, the closest way we would use it is the, word, the term abode. Okay? Um, you know, maybe you're talking about your abode, the place that you live. Okay, but the, the New Testament word abide, uh, I, I'm reminded of the difference between living out of that extended de- stay hotel and finally moving into our house. There was a difference between those two. There was a, a different way of living. When you abide in something, when you fi- make some place your abode, your living space, your home, when you abide in something... You get your things out. You you decorate. You plan to stay. You make it a home. You paint the walls. You put up pictures. You uh, you put your clothes in a, in a, a, a chest of drawers. You, you you do all of these things that you wouldn't do if you were just staying in a hotel. It's it's an abode. It's it's a place where you you plan to abide. It's a place where you plan to stay. I think that this is what John is calling us to 
in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 29. So uh, verse 3 through the end of the chapter of 1 John 2 is where we're going to be today. We can know that we have eternal life because we've chosen to abide with Jesus and his people rather than the world. We've unpacked our bags. We've put up pictures. We've uh, made the decision to submit ourselves to an eldership. We've uh, decided that uh, the, the, the Broad Street Church is going to be our church and we're going to, to live with these people and talk with these people and go to game night with these people. As boring as Mexican trained dominoes is, we're, we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to be with these people and spend time with them and, and these are our people and God is our God and we plan to stay. That's what 1 John chapter 2 is about. And I think it's helpful for us to go through 1 John chapter 2 verses 3 through 29 to talk about this subject so that we can know that we have eternal life. Remember, 1 John 5 13 says, I am writing these things to you, little children, so that you may know that you have eternal life. I want you to know it. Not, uh, not have guesswork about it, not wonder, oh, I, I, I hope that I'm saved, I hope that I have eternal life, I hope that, that God will save me, but know it. I think this is helpful for us in knowing that we have eternal life. If you've decided to make, make Christ your abode, your home, this is the way that I'm going to live. These are the values that I'm going to have. This is, is the, the thing that's going to color everything else in my life. The, 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 the way that I act when I go to work, the way that I act when I go to school, the way that I talk to other people, uh, the way that I act on social media, uh, the way that I do everything in my life is going to be colored by this thing because this is my home. When we moved to Alabama, my stepmother... I don't know that she liked it very much because she's from Texas. You know those people? Chelsea, you know? You know I, I don't know if you put up Texas flags in your house, but she did, okay? I mean, I, she's from Texas. See, I don't, I'm not from Alabama. I'm from Texas. And I, I, remember, I remember she, you know, no matter how long we lived in Alabama, no matter how long we lived in Birmingham, she was a Texan. She had that flag up, okay? She had the Texas decor up. That was her home. She never really embraced Birmingham because Texas was her home. So what have we embraced? Have we embraced our abode in Jesus or are we, are we really just embracing our abode in the world? That's what we're going to talk about today. So get your Bibles out. Verse 3, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. We're going to first talk about abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. And by this, John says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. In this paragraph, there are several congruent statements. Okay? There are several statements that equal one another. Knowing Christ, okay, if, you, if, you, if you make notes in your Bible, you underline, I want you to, to underline knowing Christ. Keeping his commandments, the love of God abides in him, walk in the same way in which he walked. There are five statements there. I know him, keeping his commandments, love of God abides in him, and walk in the same way in which he walked. Those are all congruent statements. They all mean the same thing. They're all talking about the same thing, that, that, that Christ is who you've chosen. You've chosen Christ over the world. You've chosen him as your abode. You've chosen the church 
over some other place of abiding. Those are all congruent terms. Abiding in Christ is first and foremost about finding your values, your sense of purpose, your hopes and dreams, and your direction in life in Christ. You can know that you have eternal life if you abide in Him. And you can know that you abide in Him because He colors everything about your life. He commands your hopes and your dreams. He commands uh, your values. He commands the way that you walk, the way that you talk, the way that you live. He is, has His fingers in all parts of your life. As the kids' song says, His fingerprints are everywhere are they everywhere in your life? Okay. This, that's the sign of someone who abides in Christ. This is important to you. It's, it's, a, it's a core value to your life that you are a Christian, that you are a follower of Jesus. It's not just a bumper sticker. It's not just a Hobby Lobby decoration in your house. It's not just a, a little necklace that you wear around your, around your neck. It's not just a trendy tattoo that you get on your body. Does it actually, are his fingerprints actually in all places of your life? In your work, in your school, in, in uh, the way that you talk, in, in what you read, in, uh, in, in all areas of your life, do you see his fingerprints? Then he goes on, verse 7, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment. This is something you already know. But an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. But whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So the first part of abiding in Christ is, is do you love Christ? Is, does, do you share his values? Do you walk in the way that he walked? Do you, do you uphold his commandments and try to, to live them in your life? Do you love God? Do you love Christ? The second essential of abiding in Christ and in his light is that we love each other. Do you love each other? Do you love each other? I believe here John is echoing what he was taught by Jesus in John 13. John 13, 34 and 35. Y'all know that verse. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all people will know that you are my followers because of the love that you have for each other. John is, is taking that teaching that he learned from Jesus as he watched Jesus get down and wash the feet of him and, and all of the other disciples. As he watched Jesus get down and wash the feet of Peter, who he knew would deny him. As he watched Jesus get down and wash the feet of Judas who he knew would betray him. John saw what brotherly love really means. And he's trying to, to impress upon us that if you abide in Christ, that is a very, very important part of it. You're not abiding in Christ if you hate each other. If you mistreat each other. If you gossip about each other. If you ignore each other. That's not abiding in Christ. In fact, John says, no, you're actually, if you say that you abide in Christ, but then you do those things, you hate each other, you're actually a liar. You're lying. John says. 
Of course, I think that Jesus in his teaching would certainly extend this idea to go beyond physical family and spiritual family to be loving our neighbors and even our enemies, as he taught us in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? John chapter 10, or Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Abiding in Christ is about the two greatest commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor. That's what it's about. Now, are we going to be perfect at that? No. Remember last week we talked about how we're not perfect, right? We're not, we're not righteous, right? And, and so God has made a system where what we do when we're not perfect, when we're unrighteous, when we make mistakes, when we fail to walk in the light, when we fail to, uh, to abide in Christ, when we fail to keep his commandments and fail to love our brother, brother the way that we should, he has, he's set up a, a plan for us to be able to go and confess to him and acknowledge that sin, acknowledge that shortcoming, and maybe acknowledge it to the person who we've harmed. He set up that plan. We're not going to do that perfectly, but have we made it a point in our lives to do this? I'm going to love God and I'm going to love my neighbor and and I'm going to do my very best at that. I'm going to try not to fail at that. I'm going to try not to live like living in the world. Have we made that decision? Now, There's a little weird section here as we move on to verses 12 through 14, where John, it's almost like a parenthesis in John's book. He pauses for a second. So he's talked about, uh, you're you're in the family, you're abiding in Christ, you're loving God, you're loving the brothers, uh, you're, you're in the family, and then before he talks about abiding in the world, he has this this strange poem in verses 12 through 14, where he gives these terms of endearment. But I think it makes perfect sense. John has just been saying, if you want to, uh, if you want to know that you have eternal life, you've got to abide in Christ. You've got to, to, uh, to love God and love the brothers. You've got to make sure that you know that you're part of the family. And that this family is a priority for you. And then he goes into uh, verses 12 through 14 and he gives terms of family endearment almost to say, and yes, you are doing this. You are part of the family. You are someone who has chosen to abide in Christ. You are someone who is of the household of God. You are a brother, a sister. You are a a father in in, in the church. You are a, a little child in the church. You are part of this community. You have done this. It's terms of family endearment. Look at verses 12 through 14. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And if you have, have overcome the evil one. I don't think that John is only addressing fathers, young men, and little children. I don't think that's his point here. I think these are ancient terms of endearment. He's talking to young people, middle-aged people, and old people. Okay? I think that these are first century terms of endearment. I'll just use Lee. Uh, we use, I use Lee for everything. Uh, Lee, what's your term of endearment for Michelle? Oh, Okay. Is it like, you know, like, what, what's your, like, Pookie Bear, Honey Bunny, Boog, Booger Sugar, <laughs> not Booger Sugar, okay, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't, what's your term of, of family endearment, I don't, I don't know what it is, I think, uh, I don't, I think I say babe, you know, like, it's just cool, babe, what's up babe, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's what I, I call Kristen, but uh, everybody has those terms of endearment, I think that's what these are, that's what these are, what? What'd you say, sweetie pie? Someone say sweetie pie. Okay, all right. Okay, I, I think these are terms of family endearment, and he's saying to them, brothers and you are you are brothers and sisters. You are part of the household of God. Your sins have been forgiven. Jesus has cleansed you of those sins. He has set you free. 
This is you. This applies to you. Almost as if he's saying, don't forget it. Don't forget it. My dad used to say to me when I was young, remember who you are and who you belong to. He used to, some, some form of that, I, don't, you know, I, he, I may be paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, he would say something like, you know, he would drop me off at school or uh, I would go out, you know, with friends or something. I didn't go on dates because I was a nerd, but um, uh, <laughs> he, he, would, he would basically, before I left the house, he would say, I want you to remember who you are and who you belong to. And as a teenager, I'm like, okay, Dad, <laughs> you know, whatever. I'm going to play golf with, you know, I'm, I'm going to go hang out. I'm going to go to the mall. We're going to go to the movies. Whatever, Dad. But as an adult, I look back at that, and I, I, I think fondly on that, that sense of encouragement. Because what my dad was trying to do was remind me that I, I have a family name. I, I'm a Kirby. I'm, I'm, I'm a representative of the, of the Kirby family out in, in public, number one. But number two, I have a spiritual family. I'm a child of God. And I can't forget that. And so John gives these, these terms of family endearment. He, he, he says uh, three times, he says, little children, fathers, young men. And then he does it again. Little children, fathers, young men. And he wants to remind us that we do abide in Christ. You have chosen this life as your life. You have chosen Christ as your abode and not the world. And remember that. Remember that. And then he's going to talk to us about abiding in the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world. Okay, remember, he's talked this whole time about uh, loving Christ, abiding in Christ, loving God, loving your brother. Now he's going to talk about abiding in the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. What is a congruent term to abides forever? It's this whole, the, the sermon series that we're talking about. What does it mean to abide forever? What's another way of saying that? Eternal life. That's what he's talking about. Don't love the world because the world's passing away. Love God because, lo because God is eternal life. God is eternal life. The opposite of abiding in Christ is abiding in or loving the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the idols of money, sex, and power are the primary temptations that the enemy uses to lure us away from abiding in Christ. I'm going to give you an illustration. And I used to I could get away with give, doing these illustrations because my kids went upstairs, but now they stay down here. So they're going to know I'm talking about them. But my kids, and I don't know that they love it as much as they used to, but they love to stay in hotels. Y'all remember when you were little? I mean, they love to stay in hotels, okay? They, they just absolutely love it. They want, it, want to stay in hotels all the time. They love to stay in hotels despite the fact that hotels are uncomfortable, okay, unfamiliar, and clearly not home. Hotels are clearly not home. In fact, it is the newness. The fact that it is different that appeals to them. But eventually, they are happy to go home where they have their beds and their clothes and their toys and their hammocks outside and their trampoline outside and their zip line outside and their swing outside and their, their tree house outside. They're happy to go home to that eventually. When we 
love the world. It's like loving a hotel over home. Because it's shiny and it's different and, and, and it's exciting, you know. You get to go to the hotel and you get to go down in the lobby and maybe there will be other kids there. And, and, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's fun for a minute. There is a, a, a little sense of fun and a little sense of pleasure in doing it. It's fun for a minute, because, but it's not home. The pleasures of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life gives us a sense of fulfillment in the moment, but it is not lasting. It's fleeting. It doesn't last forever. It's not our home because remember, John called us by his terms of family endearment, sweetie pie. He called us by his terms of family endearment because we have decided to make our home in Christ, not in the world. John says, don't do this. Don't fall for the enemy's trick. That the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the, and the pride of life, the enemy's trick that he did all the way back with Adam and Eve, that he tried with Jesus and that he tries with you and with me. The enemy's trick, it does not last. And it is not fulfilling. And then... John gives an example of what it would mean to love the world. And his example is the following of false teachers. Okay? His example is the following of false teachers. Now we could fill in the blank with anything today as an example. But the, the example that he uses is following false teachers. He says in verse 18, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they, are not, that, they, that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Whoever is a, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life don't forget that i write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you but the anoint but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie just as as it is taught you abide in him so john explains they're living in the world because they've gone after this false doctrine. The false doctrine that most likely he's talking to is the beginnings of something called Gnosticism. Okay? We, we still deal with it today. Uh, it's in different shapes and different sizes. But uh, among many things, the main idea of this doctrine was that flesh is evil. And so God could never have become flesh and blood. So believers of this doctrine therefore denied the incarnation of Christ, making all of Christ's atoning work null and void. And so John's having to deal with that. There were false teachers who came out from the church who taught this doctrine that, that there's no way that Christ could uh, have, have actually become flesh, that God could have become flesh because uh, flesh is evil. And they were believing that. They were believing that. And John just reminds them, look, number one, you've received the Holy Spirit, okay? You've seen his fruit in your life. Number two, you have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Stop denying him. Stop believing a doctrine that denies him. Number three, you've seen that what we've taught you is true. Stop believing the lies of other people. Now, I would probably say this is not the, the false doctrine that we're most dealing with in the church today, okay? There are a lot of other doctrines uh, that we're dealing with today, 
And there are a lot of other doctrines that we're dealing with today that negate the gospel and the central tenets of the faith. And those should be rejected. This is part of abiding in Christ. This is part of, of, of deciding not to live in the world. These should be marked and avoided at all costs if we are to abide in Christ. This is an example of choosing to abide in Christ and not in the world. And so, John has laid out the terms of our agreement. We have been invited to make our abode with Christ. Provided we learn to love God and love each other. And John has encouraged us by calling us with terms of family endearment. And finally, John has warned us not to give in to the fleeting desire to abide in the enemy's world. We know that we have eternal life because we've made abiding in Christ our priority. So let's close with one final encouragement from the Apostle John. Verses 28 and 29 from our scripture reading this morning. Terms of family encouragement. He says, and now, little children, abide in him. Abide in him. Why? Why, John? So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Abide in him so that when he returns, you don't have to hide in shame. That's what John tells us. Your spouse ever go on a trip somewhere? And she asks you to wash the dishes before she gets back? It's happened. We have a dishwasher now, so it's a little bit easier, but it's happened. Hey, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to do this with the kids. Hey, could you make sure that the dishes are washed by the time I get back so I don't have to worry about that or deal with it? Reasonable request, right? Sure, great, yeah. Could you make sure that, that you know, the floors get vacuumed so I don't, have to, I don't have to deal with it whenever I get back from this trip with the kids? Yeah, 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 that's great. And so uh, here's what you do. You get busy in the yard doing something in the yard. You get busy playing video games if you're me or you, you read a book or you do this or you do that. You're watching TV. You're watching a movie. And then she comes back and she's coming down the driveway. And guess what you haven't done? You haven't done the dishes. You haven't vacuumed the carpet. And... You have that feeling of shame because she just asked for a simple gift from you, a simple request from you. And so you have that feeling of shame as she returns. John says, don't let that happen with Jesus. Abide in him. Don't have one foot in the world and one foot in Jesus. Abide in Him. Abide in Him. Don't have your feet firmly planted in Jesus on Sunday and then Monday through Saturday just go and, and be a, a, a total hellion. Don't do that. Abide in Him, John says. And we can know that we have eternal life. We can know that we have eternal life. And so I say to you this morning, has Jesus given you keys to the house or are you just a squatter? Has Jesus given you keys to the house or are you just a squatter? Let's make the decision to be fully in Christ and abide in Him, and be sure of our salvation, and know. Let's abide in Christ today, and know that we have eternal life in Him, 
tomorrow and the next day and every day from here on forward, even into eternal life when there are no days and no nights, it's just eternal day. If we can help you do that, if we can help you do that, we would love to help you do that. Come now. We'll sing a song. You can come sit on one of these front pews. Talk to one of our elders in the back. Talk to me privately. Come now as we stand and as we sing.